Hi everybody and uh, welcome to today's live broadcast which is called uh, Say Goodbye to Gels, um, Real World Use of Lab Chip Microfluidic Technology for Nucleic Acid and Protein Analysis. Uh, my name is Paul Butler of Perkin Elmer and uh, I'll be moderating uh, today's event. Uh, today's webcast is presented by labroots.com, uh, the leading social media site for science professionals uh, and it's sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment. Uh, they have a dedicated team of 7,700 employees worldwide who are passionate about providing customers with an unmatched experience as they help solve critical issues in human and environmental health. Their innovative detection, imaging, informatics and service capabilities combined with deep market knowledge and expertise, help customers gain greater insights into their science to better protect our environment, our food supply, and the health of our families. You can see Perkin Elmer's website at www.perkinelmer.com. In today's web seminar, scientists will present on their experiences in converting from acrylamide and uh, SDS page gel separation assays to microfluidic uh, or lab on a chip technology. Uh, lab on a chip technologies have been around for around a decade uh, and have been adopted as industry standard, particularly in the biotech and pharma environment. The largest community performing nucleic acid and protein separation is, however, the academic research community and mostly they are running traditional gel methods. The goal of today's session is to demystify this area for everyone, including the academic researchers, about the alternatives available and the possible benefits that they can bring. Before we start, there are a few instructions. Uh, we want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Um, answers are welcome too, if you would like, and you can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and type in your comments and questions. We will try to get as, uh, to as many as we can, and we will follow up if we don't have time today. If you'd like a better look, you can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. And if you can't hear or see the presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right, or use the Q&A button, and we'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. The webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits, and if you click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. But now let's get right to, the, um, to today's presentations. We are proud to welcome Sandra Doran, Dr. Julius Costin, and Veronica Del Chiva. Starting with Sandra Doran, uh, Sandra Doran is a medical scientist for Pathwest Clinical Immunology at the Fiona Stanley Hospital in Perth in Western Australia. HLA typing is a large component of the work performed by clinical immunology, primarily for solid organ and bone marrow transplantation. The majority of her experience in this department has involved working with the molecular-based HLA typing assays. Originally, this involved Sanger sequence-based typing methods, and more recently, she has been heavily involved in the implementation of next generation sequencing using the Life Technologies Iron Torrent platform. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Sandra, and um, thank you very much for talking today, Sandra, especially as you're based in uh, Western Australia and it's 10 o'clock at night uh, or after that. So, um, so thanks again, and over to you, Sandra. Thanks, Paul. Um, good morning, every, everybody. Um, as as Paul has just indicated, I am I'm with the Department of Clinical Immunology in Perth, Western Australia at the new, just opened in the last two years, Fiona Stanley Hospital. So at um, Clinical Immunology, we, the main test we have, we have an immunopathology section where we look after HIV viral load and quantiferon TB assays. We also have a section involved with autoimmunity, um, doing immunofluorescence based assays for autoantibodies. We have serology-based typing uh, for our solid organ donation program 
and as Paul mentioned, molecular based typing, where the majority of that is HLA. We do transplantation and non-transplantation genetics in this team. So just a quick background. Um, the majority of our work is related to donor and patient of solid organ and bone marrow transplantation. The genes of interest are located on chromosome 6 in the major histocompatibility complex and encode, encode the histocompatibility leukocyte antigen, so HLA molecules. These molecules are important in the regulation of the immune system and present antigenic peptides to T cells. The HLA genes are known to be the most polymorphic gene system in humans where most of the polymorphism is combined to the peptide binding group of the molecule. HLA A, B, C, DRB1, DQB1 and DPB1 are genes known to be most important to transplantation. So um, previously for stain our sequence based typing applications, um, the region of interest would be amplified and then run on a gel prior, prior to purification through um, various PCR reactions. So rather than running every, every sample, potentially nice, up to 96 on any one run, only positive and negative controls to determine the validity of the assay, along with any urgent samples were gelled. So urgent samples were gelled simply to speed up any repeat processes that were required. So we'd know at that stage before sequencing whether that sample required repeating. So while some users find running gels a therapeutic part of their day, there are definitely times when it can become painful. So the gel results are not quantitative. These are some of the limitations. Um, at least five microliters of our PCR product pre-purification is required. Um, if, this is, if this needs repeating, it can obviously take into your sample volume and it can throw out any ampule versus sample ratio of purification. It also does not account for any other errors that may occur at purification. As all samples were not gelled, failed samples were often sequenced and this causes downstream unnecessary reagent use. Of course, there is also the disadvantage of using acidium bromide. Even though the um, most minimal amount possible was used, there is still an exposure risk. The equipment is also bulky and requires maintenance. Um, in our department, a whole room was dedicated to gel electrophoresis and the daily cleaning requirements were never popular amongst staff. Lastly, there's also the manual nature of running the gels. Like any manual task, there is risk in repetition, the risk of sample mix-up in the manual transfer, and there is definitely a risk of getting busy with another task and letting your gel run off. And of course, um, dropping the odd gel or two was never unheard of. So whilst changing to another system would eliminate these limitations, um, our major reason for changing was the swap to next generation sequencing, as it required a quantitative and qualitative instrument. So I'm just going to do a quick overview of the change to NGS and our new workflow and where the lab kit fits in. So uh, firstly, we conduct the PCR of the HLA A, B, C, DRB1, DQB1 and DPB1 PCRs. These are currently are six separate assays and the same samples are uh, reacted in the same position across the six separate plates. We then quantitate every sample. We need to know um, that each PCR post purification is, has been successful. We then pull with fixed volumes in our laboratory currently and any failed samples from the PCR reaction are removed at this step to prevent um, sequencing downstream and the major cost benefit of that. We then prepare our libraries. Uh, just quickly, this involves shearing of Amplicon products to about 400 to 500 base pairs. We then ligate our fragments with a P1 adapter at one end and a specific barcode to announce that enable sample pooling at the other end of the fragment. Our libraries are then quantitated again. This is to determine the concentration of our 500 to base, 400 to 500 base pair region. We are then normalizing our libraries and pulling them into samples. So we pull six samples into one tube and then we size select on an e-gel. Our fragments are collected and then amplified using primers that, um, that bind to our barcode and our P1 adapter. We then quantitate a third time in the process. So this is our sample pools. Um, we quantitate sample pool 
So we can then normalize, which is very important for our, our sequencing steps. So the emulsion PCR, the enrichment, and then finally the sequencing. So the lab tip GX plays an important role at three different steps our Ampicon quantitation, our library quantitation, and our final um, size selected pool quantitation. So first, our PCR product quantitation on the lab tip. Our Ampicons are now amplified, purified, and then lab tipped. This enables us to eliminate any failures, as I previously mentioned, which is a huge downstream cost saving. The current um, method for our amplicon pooling is fixed volume, so we, we have done various experiments to determine the best volume. However, we haven't ruled out down um, further down the line from normalising our PCR products, so we will be able to use stored information that we've got from the lab chip, and obviously that quantitation data will help us able to normalise our products. Our PCR data can also now be efficiently stored um, as the, it can be stored as the raw lab chip file, which we can easily just pull back up into the software and, and re-look at our, the quality of our products on, at a certain time. And it's also stored in our database for troubleshooting purposes when if there's failures or at any point, we can look back into that sample and, and try and troubleshoot where, where things went amiss. So we use the high sensitivity assay for our library quantitation at two different stages. Um, first, a visual check is performed to determine that our current enzymatic shearing reaction is performing accurately, and it's not under or over shearing. So the example you've got here is quite a nice, neat, flat curve. So we've got this nice, um, neat curve here. And the software then enables us, if you can see the red line, this red line, this region, we can quantitate that quite accurately. So it's a bit small maybe for you to see, but 400 base pair along the scale is here, and 500 is here. And the software enables us to make a smear of that region and quantitate that accurately. We are also able to um, check our, our ligation our ligation step and monitor any our purification as well because we can see any primer dimer that may be appearing in our products. Um, also at this step we are able to eliminate any failed samples to prevent them from going any further and repeat them at the stage they require. And again all of our samples are tracked through the database whilst they're on the lab chip and then all the information goes back into our database when we've got that information out the other side. It also enables no manual transfer of samples is required in any of the steps, and only one microliter is used by the lab chip. So this pressure sample, we only have 20 microliters at these stages, and so um, yeah, taking five microliters out for a gel is not ideal. Okay, so moving on to how we actually went about um, implementing the lab chip into our laboratory. So it, the lab chip underwent an extensive validation process before implementation. This was particularly important for the 5K assay as it was to replace our gel electrophoresis for all Sanger sequencing assays, as well as play the important role in our NGS workflow. So to be implemented, the lab chip 5K assay had to meet our acceptable criteria for reproducibility, sensitivity, and sequence quality. Um, first, reproducibility, so expected sizes for each assay were determined. Um, variation in migration between the lab tip and the manual gel electrophoresis was observed. So to determine the new expected peak sizes, 95 samples for each locus, so times 6, were overlaid. The software was then used to confirm what the new peak size was and that it was reproducible within a window of 10%. All peaks were then identified by the software, indicating that the assay was reproducible. So for HLA-A, for example, our expected peak was now 3,400 base pairs. And um, at the bottom, for our DP beta-1 assay, it's 5,700 base pairs. We also then needed to look at within-run reproducibility, where 15 samples from one run were overlaid, and then the software was used to to determine whether they were in within 10% of each other using our, our new sizes that we had determined. 
We then looked at the tween run reproducibility, where we used our internal control across five separate PCR reactions, again for every locus, and used the software tool to determine if those peaks were within 10% of the same size of each other. I have a few examples for you. So our within run, I've got a class one a HLA-B assay in the top window. Our, our, our new size was 3,000 um, base pairs. If I overlaid the, five, the 15 samples from one run on top of each other, you can see that they're very neatly placed along, on top of each other and here with the upper marker at 7,000 base pairs. We can also see, which would, which would sometimes just be a blur on a gel, that we have got some background or other fragments that aren't amplifying quite as well. Um, a second example, which is nice and clean, is our DP assay. This is our largest assay at 5,700 base pairs, so it sits quite close to the upper marker. Um, but you can also see that all the peaks are really nicely overlaid on top of one another. And one of, one of the advantages of the software is we can type in our peak size of 5,700, make the window of 10%, press go, and it will tell you all of the samples that have a peak fall within, within that range. And for this example, all 15 of our peaks did. So just quickly again with between run, I've got a HLA-A class 1 assay. So our HLA-A size is 3,400 here, and here's the, the peak. They all overlaid nicely. This is the same sample run on five separate reactions. And then here for class 2 DRB1 at 3,400, we can see our, our peak here. It's five different reactions again, hence the differences in concentration. But this picture does quite clearly show that whilst the PCR reactions are different, the peak size across each run remains the same when run on the lab chip. So to pass um, sensitivity, the lab chip must be as sensitive as our gel electrophoresis in 100% of samples. So if we had a positive gel sample, we decided that the lab chip must pick that up as positive for it to go on to sequencing, and, and we set that rate at 100%. Our current scoring system was um, scoring of 1, 2, 3, and 4, dependent on gel intensity, and the reader would score, um, score their gel pictures. Our routine criteria was that a gel score of 2 or above would then move on to downstream sequencing processes. So we needed to work out a lab chip concentration that, that was a cutoff value and compare our gel scores to what we were getting on the lab chip to ensure that we was, were sending the right samples through to sequencing. So across the 95 samples of the six PCRs that we ran on the lab chip 5K essay, we also ran every sample by gel electrophoresis. Then um, did sensitivity plots by plotting the gel score against the concentration on the lab chip. So we've got the gel score um, up the, the, the Y here. So we've got the gel score along this Y axis and then the lab chip concentration across the X. So from our, from our results, all of our negative control samples, there was one on every run, had a gel score of zero and a lab chip concentration ranging between 0 and 0 0.2 nanograms per microliter. So you can see um, that there are these samples that sit in the bottom corner of each, of each assay. Generally speaking, the observation we made was that a concentration of 1.5 nanograms per microliter or greater on the lab chip correlated with a gel score of 2 or above. Um, in all of the samples run, only one DP sample did not obtain a lab chip concentration and we had a gel score of 4. Uh, this was retrospectively accounted for by just rerunning the sample and then, the, and then it fell back into line and had a concentration. So the data therefore shows that 100% of samples with a positive gel band were successfully quantitated by the lab chip GX. Next, we have to look at sequence quality, and the validation criteria for sequence quality was met when we had greater than 90% of our samples with a gel score of 2 or greater meeting our sequence quality acceptance. 
Um, we were looked at to determine a suitable cutoff point for our assays. For our Sanger short range assays, the sequence quality for the sample with the lowest lab chip concentration was evaluated. As Sanger sequence products are analyzed using a sign software, the signal strength and base call scores are used as a measure of quality control. In the table, it shows that the samples fell within an acceptable range and could successfully be analyzed and reported. For ease in our laboratory, it was decided that the concentration cutoff for these assays would be set at 0.3 nanograms per microliter. This is slightly higher than our DP value here of 0.27, and it's slightly lower than our other values of 0.41 nanograms per microliter. Just a reminder, this is the lowest concentration achieved from the lab chip. Um, we've now been using the cutoff of 0.3 nanograms per meter for over 12 months, and we haven't noticed a increased failure rate for those assays where it was a little bit higher at 0.41. So just for ease, we set that cutoff for those four assays at that same value. To determine the cutoff for our NGS um, samples, a sensitivity test uh, was done and every sample was sequenced by next generation sequencing. Samples that met our sequence criteria and obtained the correct gene type are graphed on these charts as having our results. So these um, samples that did work are the samples in blue for each separate assay. Samples that did not meet our sequencing criteria or did not obtain the correct gene type were um, graphed as having no result, and these are the ones in red. So um, for HLA A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, the assay showed that the majority of successful samples have a PCR concentration of greater than one nanogram per microliter. This is especially clear in the A, so at one nanogram, the line here, all samples that worked and obtained the right genotype had a concentration of greater than one, and all samples that failed had a concentration um, of less than one. This um, was, was the ma majority of the case for all of the assays, except for DPB1, where the concentration of 0.5 nanograms per microliter, which sits here, any sample with a concentration lower than that failed sequencing, so that is where we set our cutoff. There were a few outliers um, with any assay that did work. However, there are lots of other steps involved in the, sequence, in, in the process, so they could be accounted for for different reasons. Hence, while we set the concentration of one nanogram per microliter for all the assays and 0.5 for our DPD1. So just quickly, validating the high sensitivity assay. Um, comparisons were performed between the lab chip high sensitivity assay and the Agilent Bioanalyzer and the Qubit. They all um, had variations in, in their values and differences between how every instrument was observed. Our decision to go with the LabChip GX was because it's a high throughput platform. We had the ability to run a 96 well plate, and we also could easily interchange it with the 5K assay, which would in turn obviously replace our gel electrophoresis for our PCR amplicons. Um, once the instrument was acquired, sequencing runs were optimized using the concentrations and sizing data provided by the LabChip. So for this purpose, we we got the instrument first, and then we worked up our, um, our sequencing steps using the data that the that, that instrument gave us and optimized from there. So in conclusion, our 5K assay is as sensitive as gel electrophoresis in 100% of the samples. It was re reproducibility within 10% was met for all samples. And our cutoff values, as I mentioned, were one nanogram per microliter for our long range assays, except for our DP beta 1, which is our largest assay, and that at is cutoff has, is 0 0.5 nanograms per microliter. We also then determined a 0 0.3 nanogram per microliter for all our short range assays, our standard sequence based typing assays. Our high sensitivity assay is appropriate for our post PCR and NGS quantitation requirements. So the lab chip was, um, validation was completed and we implemented it into our routine workflow on the 23rd of December last year. So just quickly, the lab chip impact on immunology. So only small quantities of gels are now made. We, we potentially run one gel, one 14 lane gel per fortnight, just for the smaller assays that we haven't yet validated for the lab chip. 
so the vast expanses of gels are no longer made. Um, readers no longer have to score the gel pictures. This eliminates variation in results. Often glitches or inconsistencies in the lab chip results can be corrected in the software without having to rerun the sample, which is really user-friendly. Um, samples can be tracked whilst being run on the instrument and the data can be directly imported back into our database, which is, is a huge bonus from the instrument and, and we use this for every run. So overall, the lab chip does save us time. For the MGS purposes, the PCR quantitation step has actually increased in time. This is not due to the lab chip itself, but it's just due to the, to the new workflow and, and typing six amplicons for every sample. So a 96 well plate takes an hour to run on the lab chip. Times that by six, that's six hours of quantitation, which is quite timely. However, if you think of running six 96 lane gels, um, it, yeah, it's not really so bad. So to help overcome this, we have just recently validated and implemented a second um, a lab chip DX touch instrument into the lab, and it has effectively cut this time in half. The second instrument also helps to alleviate the queues that were forming with everyone needing to get on the instrument at the one time. And it will also provide us redundancy because even 12 months on, without the lab chip, our, our workflow essentially has to wait. The ability to quantitate our pre and post Ampula products has also highlighted deficiencies in other aspects of our workflow, such as our Ampula recovery. So the instrument is helping us to further refine and optimise assays that even though we had been performing for a, for a long period of time, um, it's information that we didn't have before and we're using that information to further optimise these assays. And that is all I have for you today. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sandra. That was a, a great presentation. Um, and um, I'm sure that there, there might be some questions at the end for you there as well. Um, so we've heard from, uh, from Sandra, um, who's a scientist working in the sort of clinical diagnostics area uh, and who's converted from um, using gels for um, nucleic acids. Um, we're now going to hear from um, an academic um, scientist um, who has um, previously or who has converted to using uh, microfluidic technology for protein analysis. Um, Dr. Julius Costan received his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Vienna um, and he worked on protein-protein interactions of cytoskeletal associated proteins uh, within the group of Gerhard Wiesch um, at the MFPL in Vienna. Uh, eight years ago, uh, Julius joined the group of Christina Genovic Carugo, uh, also at the MFPL in Vienna, uh, with the main focus on protein crystallography, uh, biophysical and biochemical characterization of proteins and protein complexes, protein purification, and structural biology of F-actin-based cytoskeleton. Uh, during the last three years, he worked as a staff scientist in the Laura Basse Center, for Optimized Structural Studies, um, also known as the uh, COSS, which is a collaborative research project uh, coordinated by um, Christina Genovic Carugo. The main interest of COSS is the research of innovative methods for production of sufficient quantities of high quality and functionally active proteins uh, for structural and functional analysis. Uh, nowadays, focusing mainly on the production and structure determination uh, of protein complexes involving proteins of the Z-disk uh, interactome. So, um, so Julius, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to you um, uh, for, for your great presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, uh, my, my title, I just call it like chips and lab chips. How does it taste? It's like more general overview uh, for, for lab chip. And I think the main question, and that's what is there, it's how does it taste? Uh, whether it can really uh, somehow resemble or just, just replace SDS pages. We know it, and I think this is just going through it, so it's our experience we, we gain in one year of usage. It. And, and without further ado, I uh, just quickly um, summarize what, what Paul already said. I mean, I'm from the COS, which is really a center for optimal structural studies. Uh, it's a, it's a consists of uh, two companies and three academic partners, uh, some people which you might know, and of course it's co co coordinated by, by our group leader, or our PI, Christina Dinovich Cargo, 
and uh, the main interest uh, again uh, uh, which we which we are doing is focusing on protein uh, in this case, you can see you can produce the protein uh, P5 crystallized. And what is very easy today is to do is, of course, uh, you have quite some access to X-ray facilities, uh, solve, the, solve the problems, electricity structures. But it's still the main, main bottleneck in, in all this. It's just to really gain the proteins and, and get the crystals. Uh, so this is what we are trying to actually uh, somehow solve and I'm focused on these bottlenecks. As uh, Paul said, we are looking at, uh, at the static protein, so only that you just know what it is. This is not to scare you with too many things, but one can look at this, this kind of uh, line, which is, which is here, which is called a Z-disk, and, and it's very important for the muscle function. And when we want to look at what's inside, there is really a huge amount of proteins which you, which you can find out there, they interact, and we would like to really try to purify them, isolate them uh, in a way, uh, see how they interact in the three dimensions space. So it's a really uh, lots of work to do. And one way, of course, nowadays, how it is, it's to, it's to try to automatize lots of proteins, use uh, advantage of the robotics. So in our case, we are able to purify the protein large scale using some active pures and so on. We have some, some, some machines that are doing lots of uh, buffers. And, and screens and, of course, machines that are able to run uh, for us either small scale purification uh, uh, screens or, or interaction assays. And these actually led to producing of lots of data which need to be analyzed and quantified. And at one point, we tried to ask, I mean, how we are going to do that? Uh, so, uh, and we will put for us some criteria which we use as a select uh, instrument that is able to do it. And this criteria are simple, it's just we would like at that time to process fast and there will be some from one to 1,000 samples, probably even more, uh, to get some simplification, especially in quantification, archiving and, and comparison of the data. Um, you would like to have a, a someone who provides you a reasonable price is probably established in the field and is the support is always important. And uh, definitely wants you to reduce the time with working with the, with the machine and, and uh, amount of the sample one, one maybe needs for us. And we compared several, several instruments at that time and, and think one of the best, uh, I mean, which came was, was LabChip, which we are talking today about. And, um, and I think it was really, really uh, one of the good ones. Uh, if one look at it, we, we really do only protein uh, chips in this case, although, although there is a possibility, and as Sandra was mentioning, that it's too possible to do even the DNA, but I don't know how it's with RNAs. But for assays, uh, which, which are provided by Perkin Elman, uh, there are several, so instead of protein, uh, you can have a let's say three or five chips for a protein. We just don't do the charge variants or glyco screening, uh, you, can, you can see here. Uh, but we focus mainly only on the low molecular weight or, or uh, protein express chips. Uh, the reason is for that that uh, the, unfortunately they have a lower sensitivity than the pico protein. But uh, what they what they really do is that uh, while with other instruments similar to the pico, you you will cook your sample in the presence of some fluorescent dye which usually binds to lysines. Uh, that's a little bit uh, not good for us because then you're depending on the sequence of, the, of your protein and, and suddenly uh, you might not, uh, if you have a protein, you have a relatively lower amount of lysine, you're not able to see it. Why I think the only instrument which is, I think, at the moment on the market, uh, which used to protein express a low molecular weight uh, chip, there you do the labeling uh, nicely and if I, if I just go further, you can see you, can, you are doing it on a chip. If you look at how the chip looks like, and you are using fluorescent label SDS, which is really great because they were independent on the sequence, and, and that's, uh, I think, very important if you work with a variety of, of proteins. Uh, um, so what is nice, this staining and this staining it allows you that you really fastly, uh, fast to see, see the results. And uh, I mean, what you can still see on the on the chips, and that's that. Uh, that uh, uh, just going going quickly here. I mean, here it's written the time of the how how much you need probably to run one sample. It's just in a minute. Uh, so 96 will play it. One is possible to check and analyze it within one hour, and that's uh, something what uh, with together with the standing, the standing something what you don't get in a normal life is SDS page. So uh, in this respect. Uh, 
I would go quickly to the software, and that's one one aspect one need to always try to look at it when you buy a machine and you would like to run it. You have something in a, innocent, simple to start, so you don't student coming there and not think about okay, I, there is a huge manual which I need to again learn and know what is going on. So I would say it's a very easy and intuitive way of of, of finding uh, which which uh, work layer, let's say wells you would like to select uh, and inspect. Uh, and what is very important is why you while you're running it, you can see the electrophorogram because that's what you're measuring is the fluorescent. And uh, actually, what you what you can see, you can see a virtual gel, so you see actually the the uh, results online. Uh, coming back to to uh, finish, I mean, as I say, it's an easy start and easy finish. Uh, what is what I really like is that you can have uh, several plates there, uh, several rounds. And you can you can really uh, see an example of electrophorogram at the virtual gel. This is shown here. Uh, you can look at that, uh, seeing your band. But the other thing which you are getting is lots of lots of. Uh, uh, I mean, it's difficult to see probably, but lots of outcomes. So like the size of the protein, concentration of the protein, purity, H, and really many things that can very easily to be then export uh, actually from from the interface either in the sense of the of the pictures, the JPEGs, uh, PNGs, and so on, or different formats that can be really then transferred into Excels and, and be shown in graph way. Um, so going into, into real life uh, here, uh, I just would like to drag your attention to, to uh, at the, at the moment, this this part where you can see we loaded different amount of the samples uh, going down, and you have you have here the gel comparison of that, uh, not exactly, but almost the same thing. Uh, what you are able to see with the gel usually when you run it, it's like more like you stain in the stain. You 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 really have finally someone like a fixed uh, fixed uh, picture with the SDS page. Uh, and uh, to really generate this picture, you, you, I needed to load, in this case, almost 10, 12 microliters of the samples for the lab chip. Uh, here, you see this is two microliters of sample and only small amounts. Nanoliters were used to do that. And the other thing, you have this dynamic range. Uh, so if one goes further, you can, you can start to play with the, with the contrast and, and so on. And you start to see bands which were not possible to see, so get different picture. And especially, you have really much broader dynamic range. Right? Uh, when you're assessing the concentrations of the proteins. And this is as well, uh, I think, big, big plus. You know? uh, so going further, unless you play too much. Uh, yeah. So other thing, it's a resolution. Uh, again, for your attention, uh, I'm sure one can try to look at these last two lines. You have a SDS page where, I mean, the gel was, gradient gel was a commercial one. You got these smiley things there. And we let it run a bit longer because we wanted to see other things as well. And you start to have this fuzziness there. And you are asking, is this really, uh, uh, is this really a part of the of the of the of the protein, or there are two separate bands? If you run a lab chip and you can compare these two lines to this one, it clearly see that you have this resolution, and, and suddenly you you see much more than before. So that is important many times to know what you're looking at, but it really gives you very high contrast and resolution comparison to SDS page gels. Uh, in what it also does when you do, as I say, so until now, uh, probably one thing about to do, I mean, on the gel 10, 10, 10 samples, having, having lab chip allows you to really uh, go through not one, 10, but 50 or 100 uh, samples, and you can start to look at the things different way. So, for example, this experiment which was done here is a kind of binding essay within running it and preparing the samples up to getting, uh, getting quantification and see maybe which of these buffers are important and not important for interaction in our case. Is, uh, it just took like two hours uh, with all, all, all these okay, manual and so on, really. So it, it really gives you different thinking of, of it and instead of like looking really small and, and running a purification and, and really say, try to squeeze amount of the samples that because it's uh, 15, 15 more gel, you can go and uh, for 30 and more. And finally, it, it brings you the quality in your life uh, because you, you can really look at the thing differently. Uh, in a kind of comparison, uh, for the lab uh, or a gel uh, to lab chip comparison, uh, what you can see, this was the assay 
which we done when there was increasing amount of protein and uh, as you can see there is a transition so there was a binding which we were able to 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 measure uh, and we did this experiment uh, three times so it was three independent assays uh, and we stained the stained gels um, scanned them desmetrically and tried to assess the values which were here and tried to reconstitute and make a binding curve uh, and we did the same with the with the lab chip so you can see the, the same same samples we were run on the lab chip and uh, we try to compare how the binding curves is going to look like. Uh, and if you if you see the the for the for the lab chip uh, as well for the gel, there is a really fair uh, let's say uh, compromise. So they are really fair enough uh, in the, in the sense that almost similar. Sometimes you can see even for the lab chip that you have higher error bars which are coming there. Mostly uh, it's probably the human error wanting to take into account that there is really still pipetting uh, some sample there, although it's a multi-channel pipe uh, and, and so on. But this, this can come there and okay, it could be variations which are coming there. Uh, but really it's very fair enough. Uh, except of these nice uh, positive features, I mean, should I to really now drag your attention a little bit to something what's, what's going into phase with the lab chip. And this is different migration of the protein uh, on the on the lab chip than on a gel. And uh, an example of that I wanted to show you on this, this gel, which you look at it, we had the protein which is called actin, and we're supposed to here migrate at 42 kilodalton, which is on the SDS page clear. And another protein which I call XYZ, it should be around 22 kilodalton and migrates here. If we go back and, and, uh, and look at that, where this protein migrates and what's the estimates of molecular weight on the, on the from the lab chip, you can see that actin comes with 48 and uh, it wise with 28 uh, kilodalton. This is uh, not surprise. I think uh, Perkin Lemmer is uh, telling you that yeah, there's a plus minus 20 percent error on the estimates of the of the molecular weight comparison to what it should be. But sometimes this is a problem, especially when you go for more complex samples. So here, this picture was not made by, by a lab chip, but uh, with some other. And I would like to drag your attention to the lane number 15, uh, where you can, what you can see, it's a relatively complex sample. And here we were looking at uh, some high kind of uh, uh, expression. Uh, so this was expression screen, which partially purified the sample. And if you are looking for the strongest band, you will expect this is my protein. Yeah? But uh, what you, if you don't have any other discriminants, and normally what you are using is a molecular weight. Uh, molecular weight will tell you, okay, this is where you need to you need to look at that. And if your molecular weight is not exact and it's just uh, really shifted up and down, it's really difficult somehow to judge uh, what's going on there. And that's a little bit. Uh, I think uh, disadvantage uh, of the of the of the lab chip. So uh, there are still some other ones. So except of the dimensional molecular mass, um, I would say that there is uh, flexibility. So uh, in the say running of the really small amount of samples at the moment, it's still I think a little bit expensive, and and the number which I call a reasonable will be maybe uh, 20 up to 50 samples per day. Uh, so um, stability of the reagent when you when you really prime the chips and have the chip ready usually it's roughly eight hours so this is the window in which you can uh, do the things and run the things uh, which is uh, guaranteed by by Perkin and we know that sometimes this is not enough especially we have uh, some people who are working longer <laughs> and 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 do this uh, it's a little bit robust robustness because uh, you will probably would like to have a dedicated person that is able to handle a little bit the chip. And in a machine, uh, because if something breaks, you you lose the chip, which costs. I mean, really quite. It's more expensive than the than the one gel, uh, which will be broken by, by by some student just just by by chance. Uh, and uh, there is so cost of the instruments versus conventional electrophoresis is still a little bit higher. Uh, for for a scientific community, it's always a question how it's with the publishing. And the, and the outcomes, which are how they will be accepted by reviewers and the people, because it's it's. I'm not telling the machine is fine, but it's in a different way of of reading actually the gels, as we as we know it now, uh, because you have this resolution, you start to see more more things, uh, and then uh, you need more or less dedicated reagents, uh, in a, in a sense, uh, to be able to run that. Uh, in the a, in a conclusions, I would say the lab chip gives really a different way of looking at this protein DNA separation analysis and quantification as we know it. And, and, and it's really good, I think, for routine established high uh, and medium 
uh, throughput analysis, and, and really what it brings, except of the speed, accuracy, um, actually automation, finally simplicity, and especially as well the safety, because you don't have to really have this ethidium bromide, acrylamide, and all this stuff. Uh, it's a diff it's a different thinking into into the process because suddenly you can you can really go uh, and try to run more samples and and to see more and and it's really big benefit. The question still remains uh, for me uh, probably okay whether Lipchip can replace classic SDS page. What of course it cannot because the SDS page uh, you will still probably use whether you want to run uh, Western blood whether you want to uh, like cut the bands uh, and send it for mass spectroscopy. Or so so more more appropriate will be whether it become, can become a standard in each lab and, and to have it. And I think yes, it, it it's possible. Uh, here I I will just suggest a few things, but uh, say that's for more speculative, but most for the thinking. Uh, one can imagine if there will be the chips which are really prepacked and you just it's a plug and play, so it's like a precast gel which you put in and, and and everyone can run it. It will be very great. Uh, the same if you can prolong the lifetime of the chip and that, that allows you really a uh, much broader window and anyone can come at any time of the day and, and use it. Um, uh, what would be really good to have maybe different markers that can really as, um, help to, to really estimate the molecular mass. Uh, the other option is to use really uh, TAC uh, specific dyes which are I think nowadays on the market. And, and can maybe then uh, increase the application range and sensitivity and, and could be similar to the Western blotting. Um, okay, lowering the price of the instrument. Uh, as I say, uh, you, you, you buy a cheaper instrument and then you will probably uh, be very addicted to that by be will keen of buying lots of chips and run as much as possible. Or, or to have a more universal gels, uh, maybe disposable chips uh, that, that are just really uh, used for 10 samples and throw it away. Uh, what would be really nice if the software, although it's very simple and easy, really uh, with this amount of that you're getting, then get some kind of work like a database as well, uh, more in this direction. So uh, as I say, how does it taste for me? I would say for, for me, uh, it tastes really good. Uh, and for, for all other ones, I think we are there. I would say uh, you need to taste it. Um, um, thanks for your attention. OK. And OK. Sure. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Julius. Uh, uh, nice presentation. Very balanced. Um, uh, so um, for our final presentation, for today, um, we've heard from um, a, a clinical scientist um, you, uh, who's converted from gels for um, nucleic acids. We've heard from um, Julius, who's an academic scientist who's converted to um, lab chip for, uh, for protein from a gel approach, or certainly um, moved away from gels, you know, I think it's fair to say. Um, one of the questions that um, uh, people listening today might have is, um, how does uh, the um, these new technologies actually work, um, and um, you may have some other questions as well. So um, I'm going to, in a second, introduce um, our final presentation from Veronica Delchiva, um, which will hopefully answer those questions. So um, Veronica Delchiva uh, is a field application scientist with Perkin Elmer since December 2012. Uh, together with her team, uh, she's responsible for pre- and post-sales projects uh, covering the, uh, the microfluidics, um, also known as uh, LabChip, product portfolio um, in Europe. She has a, a diploma um, in engineering, um, which is equivalent to um, an MSc. Um, uh, it's a biotechnology degree from the University of Applied Sciences in Darmstadt in Germany. Uh, prior to joining um, uh, Perkin Elmer, uh, Veronica was a scientific employee at the Molecular Genetic Laboratory of the Psychiatric, uh, Psychosomatic and Psychotherapeutic Clinic uh, of the Infantile and Adolescent Age at the University Clinic in Frankfurt am Main, where she participated in projects related to the research of the risk factor uh, for autistic spectrum disorders. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Veronica uh, for the final presentation of the day. Thank you, Paul. Um, first of all, welcome to the last presentation of the today's webinar. My part of the session will be dedicated to the lab chip microfluidics technology and 
how it can replace lab gels for the nucleic acids and the protein characterization. We will go through a quick overview about the run set the first after a short introduction, which would include the chip preparation in the video and the sample preparation part. Afterwards, it makes sense to show you a video about how the chip it, itself works. And on one of the last slides, I will present some screenshots of the software by showing you two of the interesting tools of the software analysis options. So one of the questions which you might have already asked yourself, especially when you're here today, is how can you get rid of these slab gels? So if I would modify this question a bit, it would sound like, how can I change the standards laboratory work to have a safe, a fast, and a cheap way of the analysis for both, for nucleic acids and for proteins? And of course, how can I collect my data much, much faster. So there has been a big advantage in the development of the microfluidics technology. And the question is why shouldn't more users like the smaller companies and academic labs get the advantage of what already exists and what has been already proven to be good since years. So this is what makes me always show the following slide. What you can see here is a comparison of two different types of chips which have been created and developed based on the same technology. This is a proprietary caliper technology. So the company which has developed all of these chips was caliper and it has been acquired several years ago from Perkin Elmer. So today we have to license to manufacture all of these chip types. Some of the participants today might have heard or might have already been in touch with the instruments which use the chips on the left side of the slide. On the beginning, the need of RNA qualifying has pushed the development of the first generation of microfluidic chips for such instrument as the bioanalyze or the Experian. So here we call these chips planar chips because they are two-dimensional and they don't have any capillary. But due to a need of having a higher throughput, and much more applications, a new generation of chips has been invented. This is what we call super chips, and these are our Perkin-Elma chips right now. You can see the super chips on the right side of the slide. To make a quick comparison, so you have on the left side chips without a capillary for a limited number of samples. The sample volumes are mixed to the other reagents, so no matter whether you have one or ten samples to run, which would be the maximum for this chip, you can use the chip only once and you lose your sample after it. On the right side, you have the last generation of the chips, the three-dimensional chips, which allow you to separate the reagents from the sample plate, which is very nice because you can rerun the samples. The chip is also reusable, so for example, for maximum 2,000 nucleic acids or 400 proteins. Additionally to these advantages, with the super chips, you're more flexible to decide how many samples per day you would like to run. You can prep the chip, for example, for around 50 samples, leave it in the instrument for the whole day, and then you would decide um, within these eight hours, how many samples you would like to run in which order. For example, in the first hour, you can run 10 samples. In the second hour, you can run additional 20 samples, and so on and so on. So you can also pre pre prepare another plate and just exchange the plates with the different types of samples. So this is where you can see some, I'm oh, sorry about that. Some benefits of the lab chip, uh, which have been already mentioned from the other two presenters, but I would just go through. So you have an immediate data collection, you have an, an immediate data take data archiving of the of the uh, in the software. You have you can have a fast data recall and 
you have a self-explaining user-friendly software. You don't have any gel smiles anymore, so the software normalizes against the lower marker, which is next to its sample. You can work safe. You don't have any echidium bromide or any other big volumes of sub substances which could harm your health. You have a nice reproducibility, a nice resolution. You are very sensitive in the way you work. So you have also less cost per sample. And interestingly, the price is getting lower the more samples you are running. It, and it is a fact, but um, it is a point of a different discussion. So whenever you need to, not, to know more about it, just let us know. Having mentioned the chips and the sample plates, Tracy is going to start for you a video describing the chip preparation. Tracy, you can go on. All reagents should be taken from storage at 4 degrees Celsius and allowed to warm at room temperature for at least 20 minutes before use. A pipette tip attached to a vacuum aspirator should be used during chip preparation. Rinse and aspirate each active well 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and 10 two times with molecular biology grade water. Aspirate from the side of each well, not from the center. Do not allow the active wells to remain dry for long periods of time. After aspirating the final rinse, ensure that no droplets remain on the sides of the chip wells. Use reverse pipetting to add de-stain solution to wells 2 and 9. Using reverse pipetting to add reagents to the chip will ensure accurate measurement of the gel solutions and will prevent the introduction of bubbles. Use 75 microliters for a high throughput chip prep and 50 microliters for a low throughput chip prep. Use reverse pipetting to add gel dye solution to wells 3, 7, 8, and 10. Add 75 microliters of gel dye to wells 3, 7, and 8 and 120 microliters of gel dye to well 10 for a high throughput chip prep. Add 50 microliters of gel dye to wells 3, 7, and 8, and 75 microliters of gel dye to well 10 for a low throughput chip prep. Using reverse pipetting, add marker solution from the green capped tube to well 4. Use 120 microliters for a high throughput chip prep and 50 microliters for a low throughput chip prep. Ensure that well 1 is empty and that the top rims of the chip wells are clean and dry. Before placing the chip on the LabChip GX Touch, clean both sides of the chip window with the supplied cloth dampened with 70% isopropanol. Okay, we have seen chip preparation. Coming back to the sample preparation scheme, you can see on the left side the sample and the ladder preparation for nucleic acids. The nucleic acid sample preparation is just a matter of transferring of the samples with a correct linear concentration onto 96 or 384 well sites. For the protein sample preparation, um, the samples have to be mixed additionally with a sample buffer, which can be a reducing and non-reducing one, and alternatively to be heat denatured. A sizing standard, so a ladder, has to be prepared for both of the assays. The ladder is in a separated tube and it's measured after each 12 sample. So this is a benefit by not using wells on the plates, and the bad ladder runs can be recovered with good ones with the help of the software options. You will see now the electrophoresis on the protein chip. This is why you will see an additional step of distaining. So Julius has already mentioned that. And the video is without an audio part, but the descriptions can be read. Trace, you can start the video.
Good. So we're just going on as fast as we can. This is an overview of the data analysis software. A lot of functionalities have benefits for the users of this software. So the software is free to use and to download on our homepage. The plate map on the left side of the software is showing you that you can upload as many plates as you want and you can compare them. So you can compare samples within one plate or in between of many plates. And as Julius has already mentioned, you have also virtual gel. So this is not a real gel. This is a just, just a digitalized image created as a projection of the electrophorograms. And you can see also peak and well tables, which are displaying a quantitative and exportable data. So you can export the data in a PDF and CSV format. In case you have to make the difference between heterozygous or homozygous alleles, you can use the, the expected peaks tool in the software analysis option, where you can select different colors for each homozygous allele and apply it to one or two more plates. And you can see that whenever detected, this allele would, will appear in both colors previously selected in the analysis settings, in the gel view, and in the electrophorograms. For the distinguishing of the overexpressed protein in a cell lysis, for example, you could use either the expected peak or the overlay option. The example shown here are done by overlays. So just by clicking on the control button of the computer or by selecting of the samples which have to be compared respectively overlaid. So the first electrophorogram is showing you the overexpressed protein. This one is showing you the lysate. That one is showing you an overlay of the cell lysate with and without the peak of the overexpressed protein. And the last Electrophorogram is showing you actually differently expressed protein in the same cell lysis. I'm almost done. This is just a, instead of, conclusion, of a conclusion, this is a list of some of the customers from our database. And these companies have decided to say goodbye to the flat shells, and we hope that lots of other users of flat shells would appear in the slide so we could update it soon, hopefully. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and please write us whenever you have, you would like to ask something, either in the chat or much better by using my mail address. I'm also in LinkedIn, so you can write me also there. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Um, another great presentation, um, and thanks for um, for all of the presenters for um, for the information that you've brought us today. Um, so we we already have a number of questions that have come in during the um, the presentations, and so um, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder um, about how to reach us today um, if you have any more questions or comments. Um, so your questions can be sent via the green uh, Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them right now and, and hopefully um, answer as many as we can. So, um, so first of all, um, the first question that I wanted to um, address was from um, Eric Rays at uh, Sigma Aldrich. I uh, hope I got the, um, the, um, the pronunciation of your, your name right, Eric. Um, but um, Eric's question is, um, uh, and um, I'm assuming that this is directed towards Sandra, um, uh, have you been able to compare the NGS results using gel analyzed samples versus the lab chip? Sandra, any, any comment on that one? Um, yes, Paul. So the, the 95 samples that we did in the initial validation of the lab chip were, are really the only sample set that we've got gel um, gel pictures for every sample and lab chip concentrations on those same samples and then they were analysed for um, the NGS. They, they were actually used in, um, in validating next generation sequencing as a whole and as, as I was saying in, in my presentation, if you want me to go back to the slide, it, um, 
we, we, we virtually just worked out where our cutoff point for a, a two plus gel intense band was. And then that did actually correlate to concentrations of about, about above one nanogram per microliter, which then gave us good NGS sequencing results for all those samples. We, we could have reported, it's still what we're using today actually, about two years on those samples that we can report that have those concentrations on, on the lab tip. But for every sample we've done since then, we haven't used gel anymore. We've just gone from lab chip concentration of greater than one nanogram per microliter and we get good sequencing results. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Sandra. Um, so um, another question that we've had is, um, uh, and, and I'll direct this one to, um, to Veronica, um, and this is from... Um, uh, Drew Lichtenstein at uh, Novus International. Um, so, is it possible to do blotting type experiments on the system? Um, unfortunately, not directly. So we can't really do immunoblotting with our system. Um, and to answer maybe your second question, which could come, no, we can't do multiplexing with the system. So we have only one laser and one. Um, source of excitation, so at this moment, this is not possible yet. Okay. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so, um, I had a, um, there was a, a question from um, uh, Andreas Bress at the uh, EMT clinics in Tübingen, and um, uh, his question, or, or it, there was a comment and a question. Um, so, basically, the comment was that um, it was said that the um, the uh, the lab chip technology could be used as an alternative to SDS page uh, and that you can use reduced and non-reduced buffers. So in theory, um, it seems um, that it would be possible to see a gel shift if proteins interact. Um, so I'll direct this one to, to Julius, um, as Julius' presentation concerned um, protein analysis. So um, the question there, Julius, is, um, you know, is it possible to look at protein-protein um, interactions um, uh, by looking at the gel shift with the, um, the, the lab chip technology? I mean, uh, the two things, uh, what, what, what you said, uh, if it should be reduced and non-reduced, okay, then you, you can look at that if they interact with the isotope bridges. So uh, this you, you will see probably, but because you cook the sample and, and you still, uh, in this case, it's as, as, we, as we're using it, uh, there is SDS, uh, you just destroy an interaction that will exist except of covalent interaction, which are in this case uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a cysteine forming with ice of the bridges, which you can, you can possibly see. But there, there is, I think we, we asked for example, and I think there is not at the moment, it would be really great to have a native electrophoresis where you just don't have any, any SDS page and run it without. Yeah. That will be really interesting. Uh, although, 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 again, you still need some charge uh, to separate. You know, it will be more like like a like a really gel filtration thing, uh, which which you can do. And, and that, uh, but again, uh, you will for the native in the protein microspace on the charges. Um, I'm not sure whether this uh, this is possible with this, but as, as far as I know, not now, not now. Yeah? Maybe in the past it would come something like that. That would be really nice because it will be in a small scale. It would be very great. Yeah. Okay, so 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 I, I think um, Julius, um, what you're saying is that um, you don't know for sure, but it's um, you know uh, you it, it's a possibility. Uh, I don't don't think so. It's there, I don't think that is possible. I mean, if you go with a native protein, uh, you cannot run them, so you need to really cook them in the presence of of of, of SDS. Or, or anything after you cook them, the interaction is destroyed. So the only which you can really see is if this is dimerization or any kind of oligomerization or abiding through the cysteines, yeah, which will be then reducing and non-reducing condition to run separately. Okay, okay, great. Thanks, Julius, and, and, um, and I think that's clear. Um, I'm going to direct um, another question to, uh, to Julius, if you don't mind. Um, and this is from um, Montserrat Serra uh, at the IRB. Um, and um, Montserrat's um, comment is that um, uh, I used to work with membrane proteins in detergent micelles. Mm -hmm. uh, they run uh, very noisy um, in SDS page gels when the detergent is high. Um, 
would these samples um, run any better with the lab chip technology, Julius, based on your experience? Uh, answer it. Uh, you need to try. That's that. I think uh, we know the complex sample, like 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 um, when you have uh, crude extract and so on. When you're trying, and there's lots of still membrane uh, left, and you have some detergent in the lattice. It's it's uh, it's possible. Uh, but even in this page, you, you see the, 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 this fattiness there. Here, advantage is maybe the sensitivity as you go with very really low amount of sample, uh, and you can see uh, much better probably loading glass and diluting the detergent and everything. It could be allowing you to, to see, uh, have better resolutions is better. But I would say this will depend uh, from the sample to sample, uh, more or less. Uh, so I will, I will just give it a try. Yeah. There is, I think, option. Okay, great. Thanks, Julius. Um, uh, oh, I'm going I, to. Um, can I just comment? Yes. It? Please do, Veronica. Um, please do. Yeah, because um, when we say it's it's worth a try, I would like to mention that we have a demo laboratory in Frankfurt, where we usually get. Uh, so we have some contacts with potential users of the GX who are interested in testing some samples. So whenever you're interested in our system, you can contact us and we could organize the testing of the samples in Frankfurt. Okay. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so um, I'm going to um, uh, direct the next question to Sandra. Um, and um, the question is, um, can you comment on how the running costs compare uh, between the, um, the, the gels that you previously ran, which, which I'm assuming, Sandra, were um, acrylamide? Base gels. Um, can you compare those costs to the um, the, the running costs uh, uh, with your current lab chip approach? Um, I can't specifically compare the cost. It it's a bit um, hit and miss in terms in terms of our department because we've actually changed our our workflow from what we were doing. So so now where we run every sample because we need that quantitation data for our next generation sequencing, the cost would be more. Because before, as I mentioned, we were only running the controls or something just to check that our, our PCR had worked and then we were, we were going ahead and doing, and doing the rest of the sequencing. So, so now we work the opposite way where we analyse everything on the lab chip and then um, we work to save money by, um, by eliminating any samples that have failed at any point in reaction, we don't send them on to downstream sequencing processes, which I think is a big is a big cost saving for the department because it it is expensive technology. So um, yes, yeah, specifically, I can't answer your question with actual numbers. However, um, yeah, that that's where we are. And of course, labour where where the user comes now and just loads the plate, it will take them 15, maybe 10, 15 minutes to load the chip load the plate on and then they can run that chip all, all day for, um, uh, for, four, for four consecutive full plates. So compared to, to actually the labour of, of gelling that many samples would, would be a lot. <laughs> I can only assume that. Yeah, like yeah. It's a big number. Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, certainly um, I, I think our experience in Perkinoma is that um, uh, it really depends on First of all, um, the type of gel that you're actually using, um, but also the number of samples that you're doing. Um, so um, I know that there are different um, manufacturers of, um, of precast gels, and um, uh, if you're running, you know, anywhere above sort of 48 samples a day, um, the costs per sample um, uh, tend to be um, around about the same um, for a sort of median-priced slab gel. Um, for nucleic acids, uh, so um, I'm going to um, hand over another question to uh, to, to Julius, and uh, this is another another question from um, uh, Andreas Bress uh, yep. at the um, ENT clinics, and um, his question is, is regarding what the resolution is like for really large proteins, and uh, and he gave the example of uh, Titan, T I T I N. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, Titan is a really bad example. <laughs> No, uh, I mean, it's a huge protein, so I think no one will ever be able maybe to purify that. I mean, it's 5,000 
<laughs> I mean, it's really huge. Uh, so uh, the the problem uh, the problem on the limitation I think of the chip is that you have this this range from 14 kilo to 200 maximum. So this is this is, this this proteins around 200 kilo Dalton. I think that's the limit. I'm not sure whether one can put something much bigger uh, as a Titan. It's it's as I said 5,000. Uh, it's it's really huge uh, there. Um, I think we we're running uh, the biggest biggest protein which we had was 100 100 kilo Dalton, and I think this was uh, resolved quite quite nice. Uh, it depends, I think, probably on the gel matrix. I think it could be that one can make something that can be uh, have a higher higher actually um, sizes of the proteins, but uh, it's not at the moment at the market. Yeah, I think. Okay, thanks uh, thanks Julius. Um, so I think we'll we'll take. Um, one more question before we um, uh, before we finish, um, Sandra and Julius, um, uh, who who pays or pay or, or used to pay for the disposal costs for used gels in your lab? And and, and by that I think what is meant is um, you know is this something is, is this a cost? In the case of uh, Julius, for example, um, do, you know does your does your individual lab um, actually um, uh, take the cost? Of um, of gel disposal, um, or is that sort of um, you know is that cost borne by, say, the university um, at a higher yeah. level? And, and, and same that, question. That, guess, for that, that's it. Actually, in in our case, uh, the costs, of course, go for the for the main main kind of institute, MFPL. Uh, so they are, but it's it's a cost which you still need to take account. Either you you pay your, from your budget or you pay it as, as a kind of university. It's the same. Co it's still the cost for the toxic waste. So it's a special waste. It needs to go, and and then there is charge on the amount of uh, big pots, which are kind of we call it black pots, where all these things go. Uh, so you 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 need to take into account that as well that with using using lab chip you're, you're saving yeah? and so it's a safety risk uh, and actually actually it's decreased the cost finally that's that's clear and and so so julius yeah um if if you can just clarify that last point i mean uh, what i mean what what sort of um have you noticed in terms of um costs when you move to the uh, to the lab chip approach compared to the uh, the disposal costs on gel um, I think uh, I, I, I completely agree here with with. Uh, I completely forgot <laughs> uh, with Veronica. Uh, sorry, uh, more you run it, cheaper it is, and, and that's that's why uh, it's good to run several samples at once uh, and to run it more because then the prices are going down. We were doing uh, some search at the beginning, trying to compare it, and, and it was, uh, I think, almost the same at the beginning uh, for for well pair uh, precast gels and and actually uh, the 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 well in the, or just running the sample on the on the lab tube. But again, if you take into account all these uh, staining, these stainings which are not there, and the kind of in the work which you have to say that I need to now scan the gels and make quantification and all these things, you know, just this as well work of the people who are you pay, it, it's going definitely uh, lower and and it start to pace pace off. But again. Uh, it's a, some kind of a number of the samples which was good to run per day uh, that, uh, that 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 it really uh, is the same or it's just uh, lower. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Julius and, and Sandra. Um, any comments on disposal costs? You know, and, and, and you know, any sort of idea of um, how disposal costs changed? Be, you know, between you being running gels versus um, the, the lab chip. I. Um. Again, really, I'm, I'm not sure of the specifics of it. We actually used to make our own our own dilution of gels, so at various percentages, just from a, um, from the powder base and dilute it down, and add the most minimal amount of acidium bromide we possibly could. So our gels were disposed of, disposed of just in the general clinical waste, which um, I actually can't comment on whether that's a department cost or a um, like a, a bigger health department cost. So. Yeah, I can't really yes, help yes. you with that. <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, we, we, we've run a little bit over, and um, and so um, I think we're going, we're going to close there. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, again uh, Sandra Doran, um, Dr. Julius Coston, and um, Veronica Delchiva for their uh, for their presentations. Um, 
And um, if there are no comments um, from um, any of the speakers or anyone else, um, I'm just going to say, you know, goodbye to uh, to everyone and. and uh, uh, again, just to thank our speakers uh, and uh, our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. So, um, so thanks, everyone, for um, for listening. Um, the the web seminar will be available for on-demand viewing um, throughout um, May, uh, or, or all the way through until May uh, 2016. Um, you will receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on, on labroots.com. Uh, you're welcome, of course, to forward this announcement to any colleagues um, who weren't able to join in today. Uh, so thanks for logging on and participating in today's broadcast, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.